Salve or Salvete, today's video is going to introduce the passive voice and go over the present passive system. A famous quote that has the passive voice in it is the motto of the University of Chicago. Its Latin is crescat scientia vita ex collator, which is, in English, let knowledge grow, let life be enriched. And hopefully by the end of this video, you will be able to recognize that tor is a passive ending and be enriched, be verbed, is a possible translation of the passive voice. Now let's move on to defining what the passive voice is. And we're going to do that by taking a look at these two sentences, which are giving the same exact information, but presenting it in two different ways. So the first sentence is Cornelius throws the ball, and the second one is the ball is thrown by Cornelius. Let's mark this sentence up. So we're going to have a red underline for the subject of the sentence, a blue underline for the verb of the sentence, and if it is within a green circle, it is the direct object. If it is within the black circle, then it is some sort of prepositional phrase. The first sentence is written in active voice, and this is what, we're, what we have been used to seeing. We are seeing a subject, Cornelius, doing an action to a direct object. Cornelius is throwing the ball. This is active voice. However, we can also present this information in a different way where the subject is the thing being acted upon by the verb or by someone else. So in the second sentence, which is in passive voice, the ball, which is the subject, is being thrown by someone else, by something within a prepositional phrase. And so this is what passive voice is. It is the subject receiving the verb as opposed to a direct object receiving a verb. To give a formal definition, passive voice is when a subject receives an action, whereas in an active sentence, the subject is doing the action. When this is translated into English, there will be an extra form of to be in there to denote that it is passive. So it will have the is, was, will be, but in most all forms, it will either have be or being. Another way of saying the sentence above, the ball is thrown by Cornelius, is the ball is being thrown by Cornelius. And also the verb will be translated as verbed with that ed as opposed to just verb or verbs like Cornelius throws the ball, but in the second sentence, the ball is being thrown. So you'll either see that be or being, and you'll also see a verb that looks like it's in the past. So those are the two main characteristics of passive, and that's how you can identify that something is passive. So I've just said that in passive sentences, the subject is not the thing doing the verb. It is the thing that is receiving the verb. So how do I show agency in a passive sentence? How do I show that, hey, someone is doing this verb, even if it is not the subject? Well, in Latin, we can do this with the preposition a or ab, plus the person or thing doing the action. This use of the ablative case, because a uh, or an ab, they have to take ablative, they have to take ablative nouns within their prepositional phrases. This is called an ablative of agent. So if we take a look at this wonderful sentence again, the ball is thrown by Cornelius. The by Cornelius, this is the agent. This is the thing that is doing the action. This would be translated into Latin as a Cornelio. When this is within an ablative of agent, the a ab is translated as by, as opposed to from or out of. As you see there, it is translated as by noun, and ablative of agent is only used with passive voice. If we think about this, this makes sense because an agent in an active sentence would just be the subject, so we can only use this construction in passive voice. And so now you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how am I going to be able to identify whether or not it's ablative of agent? We, we've seen on a uh, before and it's not been agent. We know that by noun is a possible translation for ablative of means, so how am I going to get ablative means in place from which 
how am I going to know which one to use? And lucky for you, I have made a wonderful flowchart that you should that you can go through to sort of organize your thoughts. But it will become more natural the more passive sentences that you see. So when you're translating from English into Latin, the first question that you should ask yourself if you see this by now translation is, is the verb passive? If the verb is indeed passive, then the next question you should ask yourself is the noun in question a person? So in that by noun, is that noun a person or someone like, or, or a proper noun that could be a person, like a soldier or a fireman or a leader or a slave or something like that? If the answer to that question is yes, then you are using an ablative of agent. If the answer to that question is no, then the next question you should ask yourself is, is the noun a living thing that is doing something to a subject? So the example that I give is a cat being chased by a dog. In this sentence, by a dog, that would be translated using an ablative of agents because you can also use agents not only for people and humans, you can use it for other living things when they are physically doing something to the subject of the sentence. So if your answer to that is yes, then once again, you go back to ablative of agent. But if your answer to that is no, and once again, we're using this by now in translation, then it will most likely be an ablative of means. It could, in theory, be ablative of cause, but we're just trying to distinguish between those three main uses for right now. So going back to the initial question, is the verb passive? If it is not passive, then you know it is not going to be agent. So then the next question that you should ask yourself is, is the noun a place or like, is the noun a person? Um, if your answer to that is yes, then you're going to be using ablative place from which, but ablative place from which will also be denoted by a from translation. So if it's from a noun, then it will be ablative place from which. If your answer to both questions is the verb passive and is the noun a place, both of those answers are no, then you will be using ablative of means. Remember that ablative of means is a um, is only translated using with, by, or yeah, with or by are the only means translations. If the answer to both of these questions is no, and it is a from translation, then that is a different use of the ablative that we have not gotten to yet, and you shouldn't be responsible for until Latin three. If you're curious, it is called an ablative of separation. When you are translating from Latin into English, here are the steps that you want to go to to see if you're working with an agent, a means, or a place from which. Is the noun that I'm working of part of a prepositional phrase with a or ob? If your answer to that question is no, then you will be using an ablative of means or some other use of the ablative. Because remember, means does not take a preposition. The next question, if your answer to that is yes, you should ask yourself, is the verb passive? If the verb is passive, then you have one more set of questions. If the, word, if the verb is not passive, then you're most likely using ablative place from which. Once again, it could in theory be separation, but if it's a place, it's most likely place from which. If the answer to both is the noun part of a prepositional phrase with a or ob, or and is the verb passive, if both of those questions are answered yes, the final question that you need to ask yourself is, is the noun a place? Because you can still have place from which within a, uh, within a passive sentence. So if the noun is not a place, then you can use agent. If the noun is a place, then you can use place from which. And another question that you can ask yourself is, is the noun a person or someone that could be doing that action? Like a soldier or a fireman or a person. And that's another thing that you can ask yourself if the noun is not a place and it is one of those things, then you will be using ablative of agent. So to recap the difference between these three case uses, ablative of agent is part of a prepositional phrase with a or ob. It is a physical person or a living thing. Because remember, as we saw in that the cat is being chased by a dog, the by a dog would still be rendered into Latin with an ablative agent. Ablative of agent can only be used in passive sentences. And we said we, and we deduce this because 
the agent in a passive sentence would just be the subject of an active sentence. Ablative of means takes no prepositions. This is an inanimate object that is used to carry out the verb. This ablative of means can either be used with active or passive verbs. Ablative place from which. Ablative place from which is part of a prepositional phrase with a uh, or ab, as well as et or ex or de when it means down from. And this is like a physical place. You can either use this with passive or with active verbs. Now that we know the anatomy of a passive sentence, how you can show agency, what passive sentences look like, what the subject is, how that actually is what is being acted upon by the verb. Now let's look at the passive endings and how Latin verbs will look like in the passive voice. The great thing about verbs in Latin is that everything that you need to know verb-wise, like the tense, the number, the person, the mood, and the voice, are all shown by just tacking on a different ending to that verb. Any of those five things, all you have to do is look at the ending of the verb and that will show you everything that you need to know. That being said, there are a different set of endings that you do need to learn that are different from the OST, mustis, and T endings that you learned for active voice. The basic passive endings are as follows. First person singular is just an R. Second person singular is ris. Third person singular is tor. First person plural is more. Second person plural is many. And third person plural is entor. So lucky for us, they're not vastly different from the active endings. There are still some similarities. Look at third person. Third person singular and third person plural still have a T and NT respectively, but there's just a UR tacked onto that, so that still looks vaguely the same. Uh, first person singular is still one letter, an R. Second person singular still has an S in it. Uh, first person plural it has that mu, like remember in plural it's mus, or in active it's mus, and in passive it'll just be more. And then second person plural just does what it does. I promise you will remember the second person plural ending before you will remember any of the other ones, just because it looks so weird with many. All you have to do in order to take a verb from active voice and put it into passive voice about 80% of the time is just form the verb like you would actively, subtract the ending, and then add one of the passive endings. There are a couple of exceptions to those rules, but we'll learn those exceptions, but those are only probably about 10 to 20% of the time. And so without further ado, let's get into the present passive system. And I hate being redundant, but we're just going to say what I just said, and to form verbs in the present passive system, you create the active form, and then you remove that active ending, the O or M, the S, the T, etc., and then just add one of the six passive endings that we learned, depending on the correct number and person. To show this as an example, we're going to take the third-person plural present passive form of AMO. We're assuming that this is in the indicative mood. So the third person plural present active indicative of amo is amont. The, so we're forming the active, then we subtract the active ending. The nt just leaves us with ama, and then we add the passive ending. The passive third person plural ending is intor, so that gives us amontor. And amontor is the third person plural present passive of amo. Now that we have that introduction, I'm going to go through each of the three tenses in the present passive system, show any of the exceptions that 10 to 20 percent that, that passive verbs do have, and then I'm going to go through and conjugate a verb into the passive voice in all, in all four of the conjugations. And now we will start our journey with the passive voice in Latin with the present tense. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is just show you a sentence, translate it into English, just so that you can get used to starting seeing verbs in the passive. This is the sentence, Pila Marco Yacator. 
This would be translated into English as the ball is thrown by Marcus. If this were an active sentence, you can just write this as Marcus throws the ball. But since, it, since this is indeed in the passive voice, we have to do this wonderful is verb translation. And so now I'm going to show you the first exception to the, just the straight, get rid of the active ending and add the passive ending. In third conjugation and third IO conjugation, the second person singular ending will be eris and not iris. The reason for this being is that the Romans did not like the short I R sound right next to each other. And so they were like, all right, let's just take this first I. Let's not make it an I, let's make it an E. Close enough. And so I'm going to just give you a quick example of this. We took the verb copio. Its second person singular active form is copis. If we just got rid of the active second person singular ending, the S, that would leave us with copy. And then if we added the RIS onto that, that would give us the IRIS ending that we are trying to avoid. So only for second person singular do we also have to get rid of the vowel so we can add the ERIS ending. So the proper second person singular present passive ending of copio would be copperus. In the fourth conjugation, that first I is long. So that does not apply because the Romans were fine with a long I R I S ending. So the second person singular present passive form of fourth conjugation verb, we'll pick audio, would be audiris. Another exception that I forgot to just throw out up here, for first person singular, you don't get rid of the O, you just add the, you just add the R straight onto the O. So if we just took amo, the first person singular present passive form of that would be amor. It wouldn't just be arm, armor, or ammer, or something like that. Like, that's just awkward. So they just leave the O on, on onto that, and you just add the R. Um, when you get to future for first and second conjugations, it will do that same thing. You don't get rid of the O. You just tack the O, you just tack the R straight onto that. But if the if the first person singular ending is supposed to be an M, as is the case with all of imperfect and third, third IO and fourth future, then you do swap that M with an R. But I will show you that when I conjugate it out later. And so the present tense in passive voice is translated as is or are, depending on subject verb agreement. Being, you can add the being if you want to. If you don't have it, that is perfectly acceptable. I will tell you that all the passive verbs I encounter, I add the being just to overemphasize that it is truly passive, and then verbed. To put that all together so it's not all chopped up, you can translate passive in the present tense as is being verbed or are being verbed. You can also translate it as is verbed or are verbed. Either, either of those four, depending on subject verb agreement, is completely acceptable. And we will now begin the conjugating charts with the present tense in passive voice of Latin verbs. I have one verb for each of the conjugations, and I'll do this one conjugation at a time. And so we're going to start with specto as our first conjugation verb, because let's face it, amo is indeed overused. And so starting with the first person singular. The first person singular present passive indicative form of specto is spector. And it is translated as I am being watched or I am watched. As you see there, that's one of the exceptions that I mentioned. It's not like spec specter. I can't say it without an O. There, there is a vowel there um, before the R. So we just tack the R onto the O and just make that form a little longer. The second person singular form would be spectaris. If it were active, it would be spectas, and then we can just drop that S and add the RIS onto that. 
Here, since it's not a short I, I can do that without having to do anything else. It's a, it's a long A, and long A R was completely acceptable. Uh, third person singular is spectator. That is translated as his being is he is watched or he is being watched. I stopped doing the being after first er, first person singular, and second person singular because space was a premium. But just know that you can insert that being into there. First person plural is spectamor. Remember, it would be spectamus if it were active. We can get rid of that moose and add more onto that. Uh, second person plural is spectam mini, which is translated as y'all are watched or y'all are being watched, uh, which is unsettling, yes, but luckily this is just an example, so not true. But third person plural is spectantor and is translated as they are watched or they are being watched. Uh, second conjugation, the verb I chose was wideo. Something to note. Some verbs do take on different meanings in the active and in the passive. Wideo is one of those verbs. We know wideo means to see. In the passive, it can mean to be seen, or it can also mean to seem. The best example of this is the motto of North Carolina, Esse quam wideri, to be rather than to seem. So, first person singular, we just slap the are onto the existing form to get with day or and that is I am seen or I seem uh, second person singular is with dayris and that is you are seen third person singular is with day tour and he is seen or he seems uh, first person plural is with day more which is we are seen second plural is we day many which is y'all are being seen or y'all are seen Third person plural is widentor, which is they are seen or they are being seen. Moving into third conjugation, which once again, we will have two irregularities. Uh, first person singular will just be mitor, that is I am sent. Uh, second person singular, here is where our first, or not our first, but here's where our first big sort of change is. Second person singular would be miteris and that is, you are sent. It is very important to have a short E onto that because second person singular in the future will be miteris with a long E. And the only difference between miteris and miteris is a long E. And this is one of the more annoying things with Latin is when two forms are ambiguous except for one singular long letter, but unfortunately it's just something that you're going to have to get used to. So miteris with, with a short e is you are sent present tense, miteris with a long e will be you will be sent, and we'll get to that once we learn future. Third person singular here, it is not an exception. If it were active, it would just be mitit. And we can just get rid of that T and add tor onto that to get mititor, and that is he is sent. First person plural is mitimor, uh, mitimor, which is we are sent. Second plural is mitimini, y'all are being sent, y'all are sent. And third person plural is mitontor, which is they are sent or they are being sent. Remember, with third person plural, there is a U, there is not an I. There will be an I in third IO and fourth because Third IO is very special and it wants to make sure that you know that it's third IO by adding an I, but just normal third conjugation, it will be a U. Moving into third IO using copio. First person singular would be copy copior, which is I am captured or I am being captured. Second person singular, once again, one of the irregular ones, this would be copperus which is you are seized. I switched over to seized, uh, seized once again because of space, but you are seized, you are captured, you are being captured, all the same. Uh, third person singular, once again, we've lost the irregularity. We can just straight add on endings to that. That will be capitor, uh, he is seized. Third, or first person plural is capimor, we are seized. Second person plural is capimini, which is y'all are seized. And third person plural is kapiuntor. They are seized. They are being seized. Here, there is an I because, once again, third IO tells you it's a third IO by having an I in every form. 
Moving into fourth conjugation. For this one, I used audio. Uh, first person singular is audior, I am heard. Second person singular. Since this has a long I, there is no irregularity. This is just audiris. You are heard. Third person singular will be auditor. Uh, he is heard or he is being heard. Uh, first person plural is audimor. Uh, we are heard. Uh, second person plural is audimini. Y'all are heard. Y'all are being heard. And third person plural is audiuntor. They are heard. And just as an example, or just reiterating something, going back to third person singular, um, he, she, it, any third person singular pronoun is completely fine. Just once again for space, I only put one, but just know that any of them are acceptable. And now that we've done the present tense, we're going to move on to the imperfect tense in the passive, which is, in my opinion, a little easier. So taking a look at a sentence, uh, same sentence as before, just in the imperfect tense. Pila a Marco Yaki e Bator. This is translated as the ball was being thrown by Marcus. Here there are no true exceptions for all of the imperfect forms. All you have to do is get rid of the active personal ending and replace it with the passive personal ending. The R, Ris, Tur, Mermini, and Tor that we learned earlier. The translation is was being verbed. Here, that being is essential. You do need to have that being to distinguish it from perfect tense. If we remembered when we learned imperfect and perfect for the first time back in Latin 1, imperfect means not completed, perfect means completed. So, Imperfect denotes that something went on for a distinct period of time, so that being in there shows that period of time. Was being verbed, you need to have that being. Also, were being verbed depending on subject-verb agreement. And now we can just get straight into conjugating. Um, I forgot to separate first and second. Justin, take two pictures. Uh, that sometimes happens when I... I uh, have to uh, take pictures for these. But anyways, moving into conjugating verbs in the passive voice in the imperfect tense, we're going to use specto again. Uh, first person singular is spectabar. Here, if it were active, it would be spectabam, but we replace that M with an R. Remember, if there is an M in the first person singular, we replace that M with an R. If it is an O in the first person singular, we just tack in R onto that O. As we saw with first person singular in the present tense, that was spector. Um, and here is, it's just a straight, remove the active ending, add the passive ending. So second person singular is spectabaris. Third person singular is spectabator, which is, I just glossed over the definitions, we'll go back. Um, first person singular definition is, I was being watched Second person singular ending is you were being watched. Third person singular ending, she was being watched, or he or it. I just switched up the pronouns. Uh, first person plural would be spectabamor, which is we were being watched. Second person plural is spectabamini, y'all were being watched. And third person plural is spectabantor, they were being watched. And for all of those, as I've said, it's just a straight, remove the active personal ending, add the passive personal ending. Same thing, second, third, third I own fourth. Second person, going back to wideo, first person singular, bar. I was being seen, or, yeah, I was being seen. Uh, second person singular is baris. you were being seen. Third person singular is bator. she was being seen. First person plural, bamur. We were being seen. Second person plural is we de bomb mini. Y'all were being seen. And third person plural is we de bon tour. They were being seen. Moving into the third conjugation using our friend Mito. Uh, Mite bar is the first person singular form. I was being sent. Second person singular is Mite baris. You were being sent. Third person singular, Mite bator. She was being sent. Uh, first person plural. Mite ba mor, we were being sent. Second, second plural, mite ba mini, y'all were being sent. 
and third person plural, mite bantor, they were being sent. Moving into third IO, uh, first person singular, copie bar, I was being captured. Second singular, copie baris, you were being captured. Third singular, copie bantor, uh, she was being captured. First person plural, copie ba more, we were being captured. Second plural, copie ba mini, y'all were being captured. Third plural, copie bantor, they were being captured. Moving into the fourth conjugation, uh, first person singular of audio in the imperfect passive would be audie bar, I was being heard. Second singular, audie baris, you were being heard. Third singular is audie bator, uh, she was being heard. First plural, audie ba more, we were being heard. Audie ba mini, y'all were being heard. And third plural is audie bantor, they were being heard. Once again, just to reiterate, this is just a straight, remove your active personal endings, your OST, mus, uh, mus, tis, nt, and replace it with the passive endings, the ar, ris, ter, mer, mini, entor. It's all you have to do for imperfect which is what I think makes it markedly easier than the other two tenses we're going to learn. And speaking of tenses, which are a little bit harder in the passive, we move into the future tense. To repurpose the sentence that we have said a couple of times already today, uh, pila a Marco yakietor. This is, the ball will be thrown by Marcus. This is an example of the future tense in passive voice. So the exceptions, this is really not, this isn't really an exception, but something that you need to remember. For third, third I own fourth, in second, and second singular, third singular, first plural, and second plural. If we remember, we have the om, ace, et endings. And so for these, we can just remove the om, ace, et, we can remove the mst, and replace it with the r, ris, ter. But if we remember, for the second person singular in the present tense, we have a form that would be ambiguous. The second person singular in third and third IO, those are both spelled the same. But in third and third IO, in the future tense, there is a macron. And that macron distinguishes it and shows that it is future. You don't have to do it necessarily for the other ones. But it's really good practice to do so, so you can see, oh, that's a long E. All right, we're working with the future tense. But it is especially crucial in second person singular because it makes the it, it is what makes the determination between future tense and present tense. This is another thing to just remember. Passive will still follow the first, second, bo bis bit. Third, third IO, fourth, om, ace, et rule. Of course, adjusted with passive endings, but it's just easy to remember. And once again, since in the first, second conjugation, there is an O in bow, you just tack the R onto that. You don't get rid of the O, you just tack the R straight onto that. The future tense in the passive voice is translated as will be loved. Um, that um, the B in there is essential. You do need to have it. Um, will be loved. That is how you can translate anything in the future tense. And so now we go back to our wonderful chart. Uh, first, first conjugation, we're going to go back to specto. First conjugation, first person singular in the future would be spectabor, I will be watched. Third person singular is spectabaris. In the first and second conjugations, we will we would run into that IRIS rule. Because remember, if this were active, it would be spectabis. And if we just remove the S and add the RIS, we would run into that IRIS and run into issues. And so that first I has to change into an E. So you will see this both in second conjug uh, first conjugation and second conjugation. So, spectabaris for second person singular, translated as you will be watched. Third person singular is spectabitor, it will be watched. Uh, first person plural, spectabimor, we will be watched. Second plural, uh, spectabim mini, y'all will be watched. And third person plural, spectabuntor, remember, 
it's the BUNT, it's not like Spectra Bintor. As much as it would make it easier, it's not. It is, a, it is indeed a U, so it will be Spectra Buntor, they will be watched. Moving into the second conjugation, uh, first person singular will be Widebor. The second person singular will be Widebaris. Remember, with that E adjusting, uh, adjusting with that E to prevent that IRIS, translated as you will be seen. Third person singular is will be Widebitor. It will be seen. Uh, first person plural will be Wide Bimor, we will be seen. Second person plural, Wide Bim Mini, y'all will be seen. Third person plural, Wide Buntor, they will be seen. Moving into the third conjugation. First person singular in the third conjugation, using our friend Mito, would be Mitar. Remember, third conjugation is the om ace et endings. If this were active, first person singular would be Mitam. Since it's an M, we can get rid. We can replace the M with the R. That gives us mitar. Uh, second person singular will be mitaris. Uh, you will be sent. Third singular will be mitator. It will be sent. First plural will be mitemor. We will be sent. First or second plural will be mitemini. Y'all will be sent. And the third person plural will be mitentor. They will be sent. Moving into third I.O. conjugation with our friend Capio, the first person singular form will be Capiar, I will be captured. Uh, second person singular will be Capiaris, remember, third I.O. shows that it is special by just throwing an I into every form. Uh, that is translated as you will be captured. Third singular is Capiator, it will be captured. First plural, Capiamor. Uh, we will be captured, second plural, copie many, y'all will be captured, and third plural, copientor. And for third, third I.O. and fourth, that is just a straight, take the active ending, get rid of it, add the passive personal ending. Moving into fourth conjugation, first person singular, um, future passive of audio would be audiar, I will be heard. Second singular will be audieris, audieris. You will be heard. Third singular will be audiator. It will be heard. Third first plural will be audiamor. We will be heard. Second plural will be audie mini. Y'all will be heard. Third plural will be audientor. They will be heard. And another thing about passive voice just brought up to me when I saw the it. Passive will can be used all the time and personally. So with it it is seen. It seems you will see that, like in present tense, all the time. You will see passive used impersonally a lot. So I've just spent a lot of time uh, going through all the different forms and talking about the anatomy of a passive sentence. Now I'm just going to take two sentences, one going from English to Latin, the other one Latin to English, and just sort of show how to, how to attack one of these sentences. Luckily, since it's just a different verb ending, it's not totally different. It's just making sure that you get the correct tense and making sure that the translation is right, but it's not too hard. But we're going to start with this first sentence, liberi operentibus in magnum urbem petuntur. So looking at the verb petuntur, the NT, you, um, you are, dead giveaway that we're working with something in passive. Um, the, this verb is third person plural, present passive indicative. Um, that's what the three 3P, P pres, PI means in my verb writing lingo. Um, and then the other thing about this verb, uh, petunt, petuntor comes from peto. Peto means to seek. It can also mean to attack. But if you look at the context of the sentence, uh, that would not make a whole lot of sense. So the correct translation for the present passive is is being sought or are being sought, depending on subject verb agreement. So, we know that petantor is going to be translated as are being sought. Um, the other thing that we might want to take a look at in the sentence is we know that the subject is liberi because that long I denotes that it's in the nominative plural. Makes sense with the subject. The next thing is, is that we see a parentibus. We know that a parentibus, we know that a plus something in the ablative 
when we're working with a passive verb, is going to be ablative of agent. So we have to translate that as by the noun. So by the parents, prepositional phrase in magnum urbem, in the great city. Um, put that all together and we get the children are being sought by the parents in the large city. Moving into the English to Latin sentence, the slave will be ordered to do many things by the master. Uh, will be ordered is your verb. That is in the passive indicative. There also is another verb in the sentence, to do. That is just a straight active infinitive. And after these two sentences, we're going to learn about the present passive infinitive because those do exist. Will be ordered, the tense there is future. So we're gonna think about our bobis bit or ames et endings, of course, adjusted for passive. We're going to think of the tense and the number. The slave is the subject of the sentence. And so it is third person singular is the person and number. The form of the verb, the verb here is ubeo to order. And so the form that we get, future, third person singular, is ubebitor. And so this sentence would be translated into Latin as servus multa a domino agre ubebitor. Now something to note here, I know I said at the beginning of this video that passive, passive sentences don't necessarily take direct objects. In fact, they don't take direct objects. But here there is multa, which is a neuter substantive, which is in the accusative case, acting as a direct object. This is because it's the direct object of to do as opposed to will be ordered. So that's why there is a direct object. If you've never seen a substantive before, that's a type of substantive. Multa is neuter plural of the adjective multus, meaning much or many. When you see only the neuter plural of an adjective in a sentence, and it cannot agree with anything else, and it doesn't agree with anything else, then we call that a substantive. And since it's neuter plural, we can translate it as blank things. We can add the things in there since although it's an adjective, it's acting like a noun. So many things, you can translate this substantively with multa. Multa means many things. The rest of the sentence, by the master, we know that since it's by, we're either going to be working with means or with agent, and since master is an actual person and we're working with a passive verb, we know that that's ablative agent, so we need a plus something in the ablative case, which gives us a domino. And so this entire sentence would be ser servus multa a domino agere ube pitor. And so now, as promised, we're going to talk about the present passive infinitive briefly, briefly before I go through the example sentences and practice. And so this is pulled from my infinitives video. You don't need to know all the different infinitives now, but there are six different infinitives. There is a, there's one for the present, there's two for the present tense, two for the perfect tense, and two for the future tense, one each for active and passive. We know the present active infinitive. That is just the second principal part, which is translated as to verb. But now we get into the present passive infinitive. This is formed by going to your second principal part, and if it is first, second, or fourth conjugation, you get rid of the E and add a long I to give the endings ARI, ARI, and ERI. And for third and third IO, you remove the ERE and just add a long I, which would be just a, a long I. So an example of each of these are below. Uh, Neko nekare is a first conjugation verb, so we go to the second principal part, nekare, we remove the e, which would just leave us with nekar, and then we just add a long i to that to get to, get to nekari. Uh, same thing for habeo, uh, second, principal or second principal part is habeire, remove the e, add the long i, gives us habeire. Uh, for for mito and copio, a third and third I rever, verb respectively, we go to the second principal part, remove the ERE ending, and then just add a long I, which is how we get to miti and copy. And then audio, you go to second principal part, which is audire, 
uh, remove the long e, add an i, gives you audiri. The present passive infinitive is translated as to be verbed. And another example, uh, we're going to take amo, go to the second principal part, amare, remove that e, leaves you with amar, and then add a long i, and that gives you amari. And since it, its translation is to be verbed, we will translate this as to be loved. Now that I have gone through all the pertinent information when it comes to the passive voice, we're going to go ahead and do some practice with it. There will be more practice than normal. I will do a active to passive sort of quick exercise, then a forms exercise, then six sentences, three going from English to Latin, three going from Latin to English. And so here is this active to passive translation. For each of the verbs, keeping all else the same, change it from the active voice to the passive voice or from the passive voice to the active voice. So take a second, pause the video, and try these out on your own. All right, let's go ahead and go over these. I'm not going to go too in-depth. I'm just going to say the answer. If there's something special, then I will talk about it. Habet, it's passive corollary. It's just habetor. Uh, dormie bamor in the active would just be dormie bamos. Legus goes to legaris. Remember, this is one of the um, exceptions. If we just dropped the S and added the RIS, that would be leg IRIS. And remember that short IR is not a sound that the Romans like to make. And so we take that first R, change it into an E. And that's why we get legaris. Um, Yakient is the active sort of corollary of yakientor. Uh, clamabatis, that is clamabamini in the passive. Timaris, or yeah, timaris, that is timace. Um, that, that is just second conjugation, um, second conjugation present. But ponace, that goes to ponaris. And you do need that macron on that e because this is third conjugation future and that macron that shows that, hey, this is future as opposed to it being present. And then schemor is just schemus in the active. So I'm sure you did great converting from active to passive and passive to active. And so here are the forms. Given the person, number, tense, and voice, give the following forms of all of the verbs. We are assuming for all of these that we are in the indicative mood, which just means it's normal and we're not doing an infinitive and we're not doing an imperative. And so take a second, pause the video, and try these out on your own. Alrighty. We are going to go ahead and show the answers. The third person plural present passive indicative form of supero would be superantor. First person singular future passive of yakio is yakiar. If this were active, it would be yakiam. And since it's an M, we can just change that M with an R, get yakiar. Uh, second singular present form of ludo is ludere, or luderus. Remember, it's one of those weird um, exceptions. So that's why it's E-R-I-S and not I-R-I-S, because remember, no I-R-I-S. Uh, first person plural imperfect passive of do would be da bamor. Uh, second plural future passive of tereo would be tere bimini. That is a mouthful. Uh, third singular imperfect of duco is duke bator. Uh, second person singular future passive of naro would be Nara Barris. Remember, this is another place where you could run into that IRIS, and we cannot have it. That we cannot have that short IR, and so that's why it is Barris in Nara Barris. And then third person plural imperfect passive of Tonga would be Tonge Bontor. And so now we move on to the sentences. For each of these sentences, take a second, pause the video, and go ahead and translate it from Latin to English, or from English is to Latin. Okay. 
All righty. Let's go ahead and we'll start with the first one. And once again, I'm just going to go through the highlights. Uh, Doke Bitor is third person singular future passive indicative. Future passive is translated as he will be verbed. Uh, Doke Bitor, that will be translated as he will be taught, or since there is an actual subject, the subject will be taught. And so now that we have that translated, we know that a discipulis, since it is a and a, something in the ablative with a passive verb, we know that that's going to be agent. And with that, we can translate the rest of the sentence, and it will be, today, the teacher will be taught by the students. The next sentence is, the battle is said to be fought by Caesar and the Roman soldiers. I erased the Roman soldiers, sorry, but it comes up again on this one. So, the battle is said to be fought by Caesar and the Roman soldiers. Here we have two things in passive that we have to worry about. Is said is passive. This is present tense. This is third person singular because um, battle, that is a third person singular subject. And to say comes from dico. And so dicator will be the form. With, with the form dicator, it very often takes some type of passive infinitive, or it will, it will either take the present passive infinitive or the perfect active infinitive, which you won't worry, worry about until later. But if you see dicator, expect one of those two infinitives to pop up. Um, so the infinitive itself, uh, to be fought, to fight is pugno. Pugno, its second principal part, is pugnare. We subtract the E, add the long I, and that gives us pugnari. Pugnari means to be fought, so we're good there. Next thing is, by Caesar and the Roman soldiers. This is an agent since Caesar and Roman soldiers are an actual thing, so ah uh, plus something, or plus all of that in the ablative case. And that gives us proelium a caesare romanisque militibus pugnari dicator. If you've never seen que at the end of a word before, que is an anclitic, another way of writing and. And so this sentence could also be written as proelium a, a caesare et romanis militibus pugnari dicator. But since I write et in the last sentence and ret et is sometimes overrated, I just decided to throw in que also to teach anclitics. And so if you see the enclitic que, what that means is that means and, and that joins, that joins that word with the previous word. So it's Caesar and the Roman soldiers. The and will be placed before the word that has the que on it. And so now we move into the last sentence, potestas patriae et urbis a malo duque tenebator. Tenebator is third person singular imperfect passive indicative. Imperfect passive is translated as was being verbed. Remember, you do need that being in there to distinguish it from perfect. Tenebator, that will be translated in context with the meaning of teneo as he or it was being held. Um, a malo duque, since that is a person, preceded by uh, or ab, we know that that will be the ablative of agent, and we can translate that as by the bad leader. And so this entire sentence would be, the power of the country in the city, patriae et urbis, was being held by the bad leader. I could also write this sentence as potestas patriae urbisque amalo duque tenebator, just to get even more practice with that in clinic. And so now we have three more sentences, and I will say for these sentences, remember what you had learned about ablative means versus place from which versus agents, because that might come into use, intent. Um, the only other thing I will say before I turn, turn you loose, if you've never seen the verb to overwhelm, that is oprimo oprimere. It is third conjugation. So take a second, pause the video, and try these out. All 
All right, let's go ahead and we'll start with these sentences. The first one is, you, you being in the singular, are led through the streets of the city. So the first thing here is we're going to identify the verb, you are led. You specifically in the singular, I did this because I want to test that IR to ER sort of thing. Uh, that this is second person singular, present passive indicative. To lead, that verb is duco. And so the second person singular, present passive indicative form of duco is ducarus. And remember that IR will that short IR will change to an ER. And so that's it. Um, that's really the big thing. I think the rest of this is just a prepositional phrase through the streets of the city. Another thing that I wanted to show with this sentence is that you don't necessarily need an agent in all of your passive sentences. There are some sentences where things can be done without an agent, and this is one of those examples. And so this sentence would be translated into Latin as tu trans vias urbis ducaris. Moving into the second sentence, Harry multa dona tibi a me dapantur. So here, multa is actually modifying. It's modifying dona, donum, doni, neuter, meaning gifts. But anyways, I think the more important thing is the verb, dapantur. Dapantur is third person plural, imperfect passive indicative. We know to translate imper perfect, imperfect passive as was being verbed. And so dapantur is they were being given. And so the subject of the sentence is multa dona, many gifts, tibi, that is to me because we're using a verb of giving, offering, showing, or telling, so that is an indirect object. And then we do indeed have an agent. Agents can also be personal pronouns, as in this case, it is by me. And so this sentence would be translated into English as yesterday, many gifts were being given to you by me. Now we move into this last sentence. I will be overwhelmed by the smoke and flames. As I said, oprimo, oprimere, that means to overwhelm. It is third conjugation. And this entire verb is I will be overwhelmed. To overwhelm, oprimo, this is future tense as denoted by that will be translation. And so we know that it's also first person singular because it's I. So First person singular, future passive indicative of oprimo is oprimar. And now we get to the by smoke and flames, which was the reason for my hint, hint. This is ablative of means and not ablative of agent. This is because smoke and flames are what is causing the subject, and it is not an actual person. It is what is it is the physical thing, it is the instrument, if you will, that is allowing the verb to take place. It is not the person doing the verb, it is the action by which the ver why the verb is being committed. You can also think of this as an ablative of cause, and you could translate this as, I, was, I will be overwhelmed because of the smoke and flames. But since smoke and flames are inanimate objects, that themselves cannot be doing something, this has to be ablative of means as opposed to ablative of agent. And so this would be translated as ego fumo et flamis oprimar, with no preposition because ablative of means does not take a preposition. This is the important distinction to make. Smoke and flames, inanimate object, therefore cannot be agent, if it were an actual person, then it would be agent. That is the big distinction between the two, and that's the big one that you need to make. And so that is it for the video, essentially. Let's just close to sort of summarize what we have learned in so far. Passive voice is a grammatical voice in which the subject is the thing which the verb is afflicting with an incorrect spelling of which, it should be W-H-I-C-H. Sometimes when you are writing in Latin a lot, your English side of your brain turns off. But anyways, here are two sentences. I see the building and the building is seen by me. 
First one, I see the building. That is classic, subject, verb, object. I, the subject, am doing a verb onto a direct object. I am seeing the building. But this other sentence is passive because the subject, that is what is being acted upon by the verb. The building is seen by me, the, the agent, the by me, that is who is really seeing the building. The, be, the building is the one being afflicted by the verb. Another classic example, the best example of subject verb object that my Latin teacher, that my Latin teacher did back in Latin one was she would kick a trash can across the room to really drive home the point of subject, verb, and object. The subject would be my teacher, the verb would be kicking, and the object of that would be the trash can. If that were a passive sentence, the subject would be the trash can because that is what is being kicked by my teacher. And so that sort of reversal where the object becomes the subject is passive voice. And as I said, you shouldn't really write English papers in passive voice. So if you start seeing these, oh, this looks like an ablative agent. Oh, this looks like passive voice in Latin. Then you should probably revise your sentence to make it active because English teachers like that. The person doing the action is shown through an ablative of agents, which is with the correct spelling of which, which is the preposition a or ab plus the person in the ablative. So by me, that would be rendered into Latin as a me. You have the preposition a or ab, and then the person, which is me, in the ablative case. You need to distinguish between means and place from which. And if you forget how you should, I have a nice flow chart when you're going from English to Latin and Latin to English that I discussed earlier in this video. These are the personal passive endings. R for first person singular, RIS for second person singular, uh, TER for third person singular, MER for first plural, MINI for second plural, ENTER for third plural. And 80 to 90% of the time, in order to form verbs in the passive voice, all you do is replace the active personal endings, the O or M, S, T, MUS, TIS, N, T, with your passive personal endings. Now, there are a couple of exceptions. There will never be a short I, R, I, I, S. If so, the first I will turn into an E, and that form will become eris. Now, if we remember the two things, one, remember in the future to have macrons on your E's, um, especially in third, third I, O, and fourth, because there can be some ambiguous forms, and the future and the present are only different because of one macron, and that is annoying, but Sometimes there are some Latin things that are like that, unfortunately. The other big exception is that in first person singular, if the first person singular um, active ending is an O, you don't drop the O, you just add on the R onto that. So taking am, amo again, it wouldn't be amr, it would be amor. It would be something that you would actually be able to say. If it is an M, like in the imperfect and first second uh, future, you can replace, or, I'm sorry, a third, third I own fourth future, then you can replace the M with an R. But if, is it, but if it is an O, as it in throughout all of present and first and second future, then you just tack the R onto that. And then remember the other place that that short I, R, I, S can pop up, which is first second future in the second person singular. And then lastly, there is another infinitive. There are six infinitives in total, but you don't need to know that until later. The other infinitive that you have learned is the present passive infinitive. This is translated as to be, ver to be verbed, and this is formed by going to, if it is first, second, or fourth conjugation, by going to the second principal part, dropping the E, and adding a long I. So first conjugation, your ending will be re, Second conjugation will be airy, and fourth conjugation, it will be eerie. For third and third IO, you go to the second principal part, drop the entire ending, and then just add a long I, so E will just be your ending. So an example of this, mito, go to its second principal part, mitere, drop the ERE, just leaves you with mit, and then add the long I, miti. That is your 
That is your present passive infinitive. And remember, present passive infinitives are translated as to be verbed. So miti would be translated as to be sent. Thank you for making it all the way to the end of my video. Thank you so much for watching and have a great rest of your day.